Welcome to The World Shapers, conversations with authors about their latest books. I'm your host, Edward Willett, and this episode's guest, Marie Brennan, talking about The Market of 100 Fortunes, the third and final book in her Legend of the Five Rings trilogy. Hello, and welcome to episode... 157, I think. Is that right? I think that's right. Of the World Shapers. Um, this is the uh, podcast where I talk to authors about their latest books. And I am myself an author. My name is Edward Willett. I'm your host, and I'm the author of oh, a lot of books, um, something like 20 novels and a whole lot of nonfiction, all that kind of stuff. My latest uh, science fiction novel is The Tangled Stars, which came out from a Daw Books about a year and a bit ago. Uh, fall of 2022, I guess it was. Uh, that's an audiobook and ebook, that one. And uh, I have lots of other stuff out there. So please, uh, if you're interested, go, go look up all my books. Uh, but this is where I talk to other authors about their books. Now, in addition to being an author, I'm also a publisher. And I do have a couple of things I want to mention on that side of things. Uh, my publishing company is called Shadowpaw Press. Shadowpaw Press is a traditional publishing company. It's just me and the cat, but it has an aggressive publishing schedule. In fact, uh, this spring and summer, I am publishing nine books, six of which are science fiction and fantasy, and uh, three of which, uh, two are poetry, and one is a literary novel. Uh, the big one that's coming up is The Downloaded by Robert J. Sawyer, and I talked to him not too long ago. That's his latest uh, novel. Uh, he's, of course, Canada's best-known science fiction fantasy writer, Hugo Nebula Award winner, all that good stuff. I also have uh, two previously unpublished books by the late great Canadian author Dave Duncan. One is science fiction, The Traitor's Son. The other is fantasy, Corridor to Nightmare. They'll be coming out at the same time as, uh, as Rob Sawyer's book, uh, May 7th. Uh, then I also have new editions of a middle grade series called Canadian Chills by Governor General Award winning author Arthur Slade. Uh, Return of the Grudstone Ghost, Ghost Hotel, and Invasion of the IQ Snatchers. These are really fun uh, horror, ghost, science fiction. They, they're, they're, a, they're a set, but they don't really relate to each other. So in a way, they're not a series, but we call them a series, Canadian Chills collectively. And then the literary novel I mentioned is called Let Us Be True. This was a uh, uh, an award-nominated novel that came out just a few years ago and was orphaned by the collapse of Kato Books, the previous publisher. And then I have a new poetry book called The Door at the End of Everything by Linda Monahan, who's a, a Saskatchewan poet who worked as a writer in residence at the Prince Albert Hospital and spent a lot of time on the mental health wards. And these are poems that grew out of her experiences working with people with uh, of mental illness. And then we have The Glass Lodge, which is a new edition of the debut novel, uh, sorry, poetry collection by John Brady MacDonald, who's a multiple award winning uh, First Nations author. And this was his first book that came out quite a few years ago and got a lot of attention at the time. So this is a new uh, updated edition with uh, some facsimile images of the original handwritten poems that he wrote as a young man. So that's all coming out. And the reason I mention all of that is because I'm currently running a crowdfunder campaign, crowdfunder, C-R-O-W-D-F-U-N-D-R.com to help uh, with the publishing costs because you have to put money into the books to publish them before you can start selling them and hopefully make some money back. So if you go to the website for Shadowpaw Press at shadowpawpress.com, you'll see a banner at the very top about the crowdfunder, or you can go to crowdfunder and look up uh, Shadowpaw Press or any of the other things that, uh, uh, you know, any of the other crowdfunding campaigns that are going on that might catch your eye. Uh, but that's mine, and uh, I'd really appreciate it if you took a look and maybe, uh, you know, picked out a reward, uh, threw in some money. That would be great and help Shadowpaw Press publish all these all these uh, wonderful books. The other two recent books from Shadowpaw Press, I've uh, interviewed the authors on here. Mark Morton wrote The Headmasters, uh, which is a YA dystopian novel that... Uh, I highly recommend, and uh, you can see my interview with him a few episodes ago. And the other one is Nir Yaniv, who wrote the military sci-fi satire, I guess you'd call it, um, The Good Soldier. And uh, that uh, is best described as Lavi Tidhar calls it, I believe, MASH in Outer Space, or MASH meets Starship Troopers, or Catch-22 meets Starship Troopers. That gives you some idea of the flavor. And you can watch my interview with Nir a few episodes ago as well. Okay, well, that's all that out of the way. Uh, now we're here to the main part of this podcast, which is where I talk to an author. So let's talk to Marie Brennan. But first, I will read her introduction. But first, I'll put on my reading glasses so I can read her introduction. Because <laughs> it's really small print this time. 
Uh, Marie Brennan is a former anthropologist and folklorist who shamelessly leans on her academic fields for inspiration. She recently misapplied her professor's hard work to The Market of 100 Fortunes, which is the main book we're talking about in the podcast, and the short novel Driftwood. She is the author of the Hugo Award-nominated Victorian adventure series The Memoirs of Lady Trent, along with several other series, over 80 short stories, several poems, and the New World series of world-building guides, as half of M.A. Carrick, she has written the epic Rook and Rose trilogy, beginning with The Mask of Mirrors. So that's Marie Brennan. Let's talk to her. <laughs> so Marie, welcome back to The World Shapers. Uh, you were on in the original audio-only version when we talked about your uh, your writing process. I don't remember how long ago that was now. It's been a while. <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> it's still online somewhere, so you can find it. Uh, but uh, now you're back to talk about, uh, well, your latest book, although apparently you've been uh, it, like a lot of them coming out recently. <laughs> it's been a busy last 12 months, yeah. <laughs> but uh, we'll focus on uh, the one that's out now, which is the, I guess it's the final book in your uh, Legend of the Five Rings series. Mm -hmm. um, well, before we get to that, let's start with a little bit about you. I read your bio before this began, but uh, tell us a little bit more about your writing journey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, a uh, condensed version. Uh, I was nine years old. No, <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm definitely someone who's uh, wanted to be a writer basically my entire life, like since childhood. Um, and I just kind of kept beating my head against that wall. Um, I uh, got a lot of influence from my academic studies. <clears throat> in college, I studied archaeology and folklore and then switched over to cultural anthropology and folklore in graduate school. And I didn't like actually sit down and say, what majors would be the most useful to me as a fantasy writer? But that is kind of what I landed on uh, by the process I did use. So a lot of that feeds into my writing. Um, the vast majority of what I do is fantasy. I have occasionally dabble just a little bit in like the dark fantasy to horror-ish direction or you know some historical fiction without any fantasy or some kind of borderline science fiction but fantasy is very much the core of it and um what why what what drew you to <laughs> fantasy in the first place why fantasy um it's just what i've always been interested in like growing up i loved reading you know mythology books and so on and i've always been interested in history which fantasy obviously draws a lot of its material and inspiration from so yeah just it's always been what appeals to me uh you know not that i don't enjoy reading science fiction and such but even on the reading side, I, I'm much more a fantasy reader than I am any other genre. So I started out as a mystery reader. I, I mainlined so many Nancy Drew novels when I was a kid. <laughs> but uh, yeah, pivoted toward fantasy and uh, really in, in like late elementary school and kind of never looked back. Well, let's uh, let's talk about, uh, well, first of all, I guess we need to talk about the whole series because this mm -hmm. is the third book and in, in the third and final novel. There are some yeah. uh, other material in the in the universe but uh, tell me about the the legend of the five rings where where it came from and uh, what has uh, you know led you so, up to this point <laughs> some of the some of your audience may recognize uh the name legend of the five rings because it is the name of a long-running uh card game role-playing game it's existed in various iterations and editions over the years uh it is a setting that is very much inspired by historical japan uh it's actually inspired by a couple different periods of historical japan all kind of mashed together for greater narrative possibility um and it's something that I got into through a friend of mine recruiting me to play in a tabletop role-playing game. And then from that, I wound up writing for the RPG. Um, <clears throat> and then when it got sold off to a new company and they kind of rebooted stuff, one of the things that's always been distinctive about L5R is there uh, with the card game, there was an ongoing storyline that kind of like advanced the meta plot associated with the card game. And so when it got sold to the new company and rebooted, I got to start writing fiction for the game. So I wrote a number of short stories for them. Uh, I forget how many, I think more than a dozen. Um, and at one point they decided they wanted to do a line of novellas uh, for the different clans that exist in the setting. So I volunteered for and, and wound up writing the Dragon Clan novella. And then this got parlayed into then doing the novels. So I've been kind of scaling up <laughs> my fiction output for the setting. But it's been fun because it is a setting that, number one, draws heavily on all of that like folklore and history and all the stuff that I love. Japan is an area I've been interested in since I was in like junior high school. Um, I've 
taken a number of classes on it. I visited the country. And then also the fictional setting of Rokugan, where all of this takes place, is one that has decades of history and development that have gone into it because the game's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. So it's just a really rich, fun setting to play in. Um, it's I'm not going to say that like writing a novel is ever easy, but this is about the closest it has ever come to being easy for me because I know the context so well. So like working within the world itself, that part is much less heavy lifting than it might be otherwise. I, I can just kind of focus all of my attention on what I'm doing with the plot and the characters and the, the sentences instead of having to also worry about the setting at the same time. So all the world building and everything is, is kind of done. I'm, I presume there's a magic system and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. All the rules are worked out. and. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's still stuff that I have to go and research within the setting, um, whether that is I need to go look up how did this stuff work in Japan or, you know, how does this stuff work in Rokugan? But it it is something that I know in enough depth that I'm not starting from a dead halt on that the way I've done with some other things. Do you feel any constraints, uh, unusual constraints writing in a world like this that is so much something that other people have developed around you? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that the constraints are huge, but it is tie-in fiction, uh, which means that there's layers of process that exist which just don't happen when you're writing something original. In terms of like how it constrains my writing, it actually feels to me a lot like writing historical fiction, uh, anything where you know, history is basically an existing canon and you have to, you know, do your research into it and decide how to use it and so forth. But when you're doing something that belongs to an existing IP, then there are people who have to actually approve the decisions you make. So I had to like send in a, a synopsis for the book, which is hard for me because I don't usually have a detailed full idea of my entire plot before I write the novel. For these, I have to. So I would send in the synopsis and they would approve it or say, please tweak this. And then when the novel is written, it gets sent off for review again. And there might be details that I'm told to adjust because they don't fit into the IP as a whole. Um, <clears throat> so there are extra layers of process, but I didn't find it super confining. Sometimes people think it would be. For me, it isn't. Um, and I had some opportunities to actually add things to the canon of the setting through what I write. So... That was actually my next question was, yeah. is there an opportunity to, I mean, sure, it's a well-developed world, but there's always niches and, and oh, yeah. openings and things that have never been dealt with. And <laughs> you had an opportunity to, to do some of that? Yeah. I mean, just with the, the first novel, it's called The Night Parade of a Hundred Demons, which if you know your Japanese folklore, you might recognize that phrase because it's something from folklore that... To my shock, like you can tell if you look at the whole body of stuff about Rokugan and L5R, that many of the people who have worked on it are nerds about Japanese history and folklore <laughs> and so on. And so there's all kinds of things that have already been brought into the setting in various ways. And I was shocked to find that nobody had brought in the Night Parade, because this is a fairly like famous image and idea from Japanese folklore, which somehow had never appeared in Rokugan. So I was able to say, <clears throat> hey, I, I want to write a novel about this idea and bring that in. Um, and there's been other things like uh, uh, the, the Market of a Hundred Fortunes in a previous edition of the game in this particular city uh, there was something called the Bazaar of a Hundred Fortunes. Uh, but Bazaar seemed to me like an odd word to use for a setting that's very Japanese because we get that from Persian. So I was able to, number one, rename it. And then number two, in the original canon, it was just basically a big market. Lots of things sold there at the end. Like, well... I could do more than that. <laughs> so I got to add the whole layer of the weird stuff going on with the market. Like that's now canon and that wasn't in the setting before. So this is all very fun. Well, can you kind of, you don't like synopsis, but can you <laughs> synopsize the, the trilogy and uh, maybe the uh, last book, yeah. but you have to talk about the whole trilogy to talk about the last book, I would think. Yeah. Um, so basically each of the books has kind of its own um, standalone plot. Like they're, they're more episodic than some of the other things I've written. Um, each one is kind of a bit of a supernatural mystery. There is something weird going on and my protagonists have to investigate it. Uh, for the first book, that is strange outbreaks of attacks by yokai, which is kind of an umbrella term in Japanese for supernatural creatures. Um, so strange attacks by yokai in this rural village uh, in the lands of the Dragon Clan. And so my two characters, for different reasons, are showing up in that village and having to deal with this. Um, 
the second book, they are in the lands of the Phoenix clan, <clears throat> attending winter court, which is kind of a big political event, uh, dealing partly with the fallout from the first book. Pardon me one sec. <clears throat> but something strange starts happening then where people begin falling asleep and they're not able to wake up. So that's the, the mystery that uh, is addressed there. And in the third book, a friend of my two protagonists uh, sends them a letter asking for their help down in a city in Crane Lands. And there's strange things going on with the market there is the, the non-spoilery version. <laughs> uh, and alongside all of these kind of supernatural enigmas, uh, I don't think it's a spoiler because I think I signposted it pretty obviously like two chapters into the first book. Uh, it is a queer romance. Uh, the two main characters are two men who are going to gradually fall in love and find their happily ever after, though not without significant obstacles along the way. Uh, so that's kind of the ongoing thread that goes through from, you know, these kind of standalone plots of here's a problem. They solve the problem, but their personal lives are the ongoing material. Did your uh, mainlining of mystery help? writing what are in some ways <laughs> mysteries um i mean I, I think a little bit though i wouldn't call these mysteries in like a genre structural kind of sense I mean, uh, every novel is a mystery really where the protagonists are trying to solve a problem yeah well to solve a problem though i've noticed like i'm usually very bad at looking at my own fiction and kind of being aware of you know, the, the less than completely obvious patterns in it, because some things are very obvious. But one thing I have noticed is <clears throat> a lot of my novels have some kind of like hidden underlayer or, you know, question that needs to be answered. And maybe like halfway through the book or somewhere in the middle, the characters will go, oh my God, that's what's going on now. <laughs> now we can actually try to deal with this. So these definitely follow that pattern. Do you discover that as you're writing or do you know it as you're going in? Um, it depends on the book. I uh, definitely with some of them I know in advance. Uh, certainly with all three of these, I, I knew what was going on supernaturally. Um, and then, you know, just had to get my characters to the point where they knew it. But there have been times where I have been surprised by my own plot. So yeah, the reason I asked that, uh, uh, the city born, which came out a few years ago of mine, I was about two thirds of the way through it or halfway through it. And all of a sudden I thought, oh, that's what this is about. <laughs> and yeah. I didn't really know until that point. I was just, you know, doing the plot and, <clears throat> and plodding along. And then I suddenly discovered what I was really thinking back in the dark yeah. recesses of my mind. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and one of my novels, Turning Darkness into Light, I did basically write the entire thing and then look back at it and go, Oh, that is a mystery. Like, I, I just wrote a mystery novel without realizing that's what I was doing. No wonder I had so much difficulty with it. I'm curious with the, because this is based on a, a card game, RPG, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, but so do these characters exist within the game or are the characters entirely <clears throat> somebody that you created? Yeah, no, everybody who shows up in this is somebody I created. It's actually part of the kind of aim for this line of novels is that they should stand on their own. They should be interesting to read for people who don't already know the game and aren't already invested. That that like short fiction storyline I mentioned, that is completely separate from these novels. Uh, in fact, we were basically told to pretend that like these novels all take place like maybe two or three years before that card game storyline began. Mm. So all of the events that kind of throw things into upheaval in that storyline are not a part of this. It's just, here's the world in the form that fans of the game will recognize, but presented in a way that you don't need to know the game. Uh, you know, basically if you enjoy stuff that is kind of historical Japanese fantasy, here you go. You, you can get into this. There must be a, few established characters within the game like rulers or wizards or I, I don't know the game so I don't know what there might be uh, do any of those characters that do exist in the game come into the storyline no in fact um, I actively avoided that there was one place where I had to sort of kind of touch on it a little bit because the setting is divided into these various clans um, and each clan has a champion that rules it and then within the clan there are different families and the different, each family has its own daimyo which is a term from Japanese history, sort of like their ruling lord. <clears throat> and I did have to put the daimyo of one of these families on stage. Uh, and it's not somebody who, I, if I remember correctly, the daimyo of that family hadn't showed up in the game canon anyway. But I'm like, it's this particular person at this point in time. And if that's not who it is later in canon, well, that person passed away and has been replaced. Uh, 
yeah, so all of the like big movers and shakers of the game timeline canon are nowhere in here. So you have a couple of audiences then. You have people who know the game and people mm -hmm. who don't know the game. What right. has been the reaction to the first two books? I mean, the third one hasn't been out very long. Uh, to people who know the game, and mm -hmm. what's the reaction to people who don't know the game? Uh, from people who know the game, I've I've generally gotten fairly good reactions. I think um, they seem, from what I can tell, to have been pretty appreciative of it. Uh, it depends a little bit on. So I mentioned that the setting is kind of several pieces of Japanese history smushed together, and it's because the game wants to kind of allow for multiple different kinds of stories to be told well within it. So for example, it's got kind of the like militarized aspect and warfare of the Sengoku period, which is like the warring states period for Japan, but it also has all of the like courtliness and elegance and art of the Heian period because they want to make it so that you can do a game where like you want to run an L5R game about war or you want to run one about writing poetry at court and like taking down your political rivals. And so even though those periods are separated by hundreds of years, the feel of them got smushed together so that you can, you know, enjoy both flavors in the setting. Um, and so, you know, for readers who like the supernatural side of Rokugan, who like those kinds of aspects of the setting, they tend to have really enjoyed these books. Uh, for others, they would rather have a different flavor of Rokugan, basically. And, you know, the setting's built for that. Um, <clears throat> I think they've gone over fairly well with readers who don't know the game at all, because, like I said, they're supposed to stand on their own. I think if you read it not knowing the setting, um, you might feel just a little bit like there's indications of the setting being much bigger than the story itself calls for. Like there are references to other clans who are not going to appear in the story. And so if I was writing it independently, I might not have mentioned those because it's like additional information that isn't really required. Uh, but in the context of the setting, I'm like, well, they exist. So let's, you know, name check them. Um, but yeah, it, it's, um, you know, it seems to have gone over fairly well. The only people I've seen a little bit like iffy reactions from are the ones who freely admit that they accidentally picked up the third book, not realizing it was the end of a trilogy. <laughs> and then they're like, so I was a little lost on some things. And I'm like, well, yes. And, and you know, and that always happens if you jump yeah. late into a series, not having read the earlier parts. It's very difficult. And, you know, I've written a, a trilogy in a five book series. It's, and it's very difficult to put in enough information for somebody to come in late and really you try, but you can no, really bog down what you're trying to do if you try to do that too much. I will say um, for the Rook and Rose trilogy that I've been co-writing with my friend Alice under the name M.A. Carrick, uh, we ended up opting, and we're not the only people who've done this recently, we put a thing right at the beginning of the book that's basically just the story so far. Like you get we, in series and things exactly. like that. Yeah, like, I mean, TV, TV does series. this all the time, yeah. I, I've seen other authors doing this. I've seen reviewers saying, oh, thank God, I love it when they <laughs> do this. And so I suspect that's going to become more common because, frankly, I think it's a good idea. It allows you to remind the reader of the key things that they need to know. Uh, if somebody has just read the previous book or they've got a great memory, they can easily skip it. They're like, okay, that's the recap. I'll just page past it. And you're not bogging down the early parts of the story with trying to feed in all of those reminders as you go, which, yeah, can really slow down the beginning of a sequel. So I actually think this is a great move and should become common. <laughs> But it kind of forces you to write one of those synopses that you don't like writing. <laughs> yes, that's true. And I mean, there's a difference between writing a synopsis of an existing work and trying to like outline a book that you haven't written yeah. yet. But frankly, I hate both of those things. So <laughs> I I was the one who had to write the summaries for the Rook and Rose stuff. And God, I hated it. Uh, but I still think it's worth doing. It's like writing a book report on your own work. <laughs> it is. It is. And it always sounds incredibly boring and stupid. Yeah. Like it is not possible to make it sound exciting when you're trying to condense the entire thing down to like a page or two. Because all the exciting stuff happened in the scenes that you're just saying. And then this happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's all in the details and the details are what have to go away. So you mentioned off the top that uh, you've had by a coincidence of scheduling, <laughs> quite a productive year with oh, yeah. four novels out in the last year. Uh, what are the others? Uh, well, so one of them is the second book of this L5R trilogy, The Game of a Hundred Candles. Uh, that one got delayed due to shipping problems last year. And so that's why it's been 11 months, basically, between the second and third books rather than, you know, a year. 
Um, and then Labyrinth's Heart, which is the last of those Rook and Rose books, as M.A. Carrick, uh, that came out in August. And for our sins, we also ran a Kickstarter at the same time. <laughs> so yeah, it's four novels at a Kickstarter. Um, there's a deck of kind of tarot-like um, oracle cards that are used in that series that are really central to the story and to the setting. And so we ran a Kickstarter to get the money to uh, pay some artists to actually like make the deck, which is, it succeeded and it's in progress right now. And you can uh, pre-order it if anybody's interested in that kind of thing. Oh, and right. then as you uh, know i know the kickstarter pains <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean it succeeded but it it ate my brain for a month especially because we chose and this was the right idea but also ow to run the kickstarter around the time that the book was coming out mm. so that like we we launched the kickstarter to draw attention to the book and then the book came out and helped draw attention to the kickstarter but it means that the month of august was just yeah. <laughs> um, and then in the fall, I had a novel out called The Waking of Angantyr, which is a standalone, uh, no no sequels, no series or anything. Oh, is um, that allowed? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, occasionally. Um, I, I call this one the bastard child of my college thesis because I wrote my senior thesis in college on uh, weapons in Viking Age Scandinavia. And in the course of it, I came across a poem called The Waking of Angantyr, which is a really great Old Norse poem. And it's contained in a larger saga, which I then tracked down and read. And the saga was a complete disappointment. It, it is actually, well, it, it's like three or four different things like Frankenstitched into a single text that don't really have a lot to do with each other. And all of the kind of promise that the poem had of like, and she gets this sword from her father's ghost to go avenge him. No, she doesn't avenge him. She goes home, the end. Like, <laughs> And so I was very disappointed when I read the saga and I felt like I needed the story that I felt like I'd been promised and I was going to have to write it myself. So I did. Um, Clearly the saga needed a better editor. That's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, it is it is not one of the better sagas to go read. Like, there are much more interesting ones available to you. Uh, but yeah, so that was something that I had actually originally drafted many years ago. It was the last thing that I wrote before I sold my first novel, and it basically went on the shelf immediately because uh, that just was not the direction things went in for me. And then a few years ago, I went back and I looked at it and was like, that's not terrible. I could, you know, <laughs> dust this off and, and try to do something with it. So that finally came out last fall, uh, which contributes to the how did I have four novels out in 12 months without writing four novels in 12 <laughs> months? Which is doable, I guess, but it would not be easy. <laughs> not for me, I don't think. Not not with the, well, especially because it depends on the length of the novel, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, the fastest I ever wrote any, I wrote a 100,000 word novel in a month. Oof. Um, the first draft. Yeah. Uh, so I know I can do it, but I don't do it regularly. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I did a 90,000 word novel in about six weeks. And that's one I would have to rewrite before I did anything with it because I didn't quite know where I was going with my plot and it shows like eventually it gets its act together and is pretty good. But the, the opening third or so of it is, you can tell I didn't know what I was doing yet. Uh, I think the one that I did that fast was the second book in my Masks of Agreement trilogy written as E.C. Blake. Mm -hmm. And I just knew what was going to happen. So it came out really fast. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you're struggling, it doesn't come out that fast. Nope. <laughs> so um, where can people find out more about all of these books? Uh, you where can find all of this at swantower.com. Uh, or we also have macarrick.com. That's C-A-R-R-I-C-K. Uh, uh, you can get to the M.A. Carrick site from my personal website, but uh, that's got links to all of these novels. It's got links to the uh, Pattern Deck uh, Kickstarter that I mentioned, or rather Backer Kit now, where you can uh, order the deck. Uh, it's got my blog. I post regularly to a Patreon that is all about world building that's called New Worlds. Uh, that is linked on my website, or if you just search for Marie Brennan Patreon, you will find it got a lot of things going on <laughs> yeah you I, I kind of your front page your front page your home page was interesting mm. uh with the way that you have it set up with the links going to things right off that front page home page see i'm an old newspaper guy so i keep calling it the front page <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, so was... all the social media accounts and everything people can access from there exactly yeah what are you working on now 
Um, I, well, at the moment, I'm taking a break. Uh, this is actually... Is that you know, allowed? <laughs> I, I, I don't think it is, but I'm doing it anyway. Uh, no, no, in all seriousness, um, last year I started actually paying attention to how much I was working and discovered that I have grounds to sue my boss. The problem <laughs> is my boss is me. Uh, so I'm actually working right now on taking time off from work because I came kind of close to burning out last year and anybody who's a writer uh, especially if you're trying to write full time who's watching this knows you know you got to actually take care of yourself or you will eventually crash and burn like so mm-hmm. there are several things that are possibly in process but nothing that I can announce yet and so until that happens I'm taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you took a, a little time to come on and, and chat with me again in this this shorter version of the World Shapers, complete with pictures. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, you're you're I think my only my well actually I've had about three repeats now. So it's interesting okay. to be able to talk to people again after the first uh, like Rob Sawyer was my very first guest back in twenty eighteen and I talked mm-hmm. to him because I'm publishing his next book. So that was a good oh. person to have on. Yeah. Um yeah, so I'm starting to do some repeats, but still doing new people, and I'm spreading out into different genres as well. Yeah. Um, so Good. it's uh, it's going to be interesting going forward, and I'm glad you were here for episode 157, I think this is. 157 or 158. 157, number, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thanks so much, and best of luck with uh, the, the latest book and with Thank the you. trying not to work so hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, bye for now. Bye. So uh, thanks again to Marie for that uh, conversation. It was uh, fun to talk to her again after we had our long conversation about her writing process back, I don't know how many episodes ago in the World Shapers. If you go to the to the World Shapers website, theworldshapers.com, you can find that uh, interview, which was more like an hour and talked very much about how she goes about writing. We touched on that a little bit this time, but there's a lot more detail there. And indeed, if you go to theworldshapers.com, you can find all of the past episodes of this podcast. There's even some transcripts from for a while I was doing full transcripts, but I couldn't keep that up. But anyway, you can find all of the past episodes there. And of course, all the current episodes, uh, this podcast, although it is now uh, video, uh, is also audio only, and you can listen to all of those and all of these, all of the old ones and the new ones, uh, wherever fine podcasts are purveyed. Um, you can also find the World Shapers on Facebook at the World Shapers, and you can find it on Twitter at the World Shapers. You can find me at edwardwillett.com. That's my name down there. Put a .com on it and that'll work. We'll take the space out in the middle. <laughs> you can find me on Facebook at edward.willett. So put a dot in that space. You can find me on Twitter, uh, x, at ewillett. And you can find me on Instagram at edwardwilletauthor. And of course, you can find me on YouTube, which is quite likely where you are watching this, at Edward Willett. Uh, also here on my YouTube channel, you will find my Walking in Regina playlist. Uh, not quite every day, but several times a week. I live stream my walks here in my hometown of Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, so you might want to check those out. And uh, you'll find a few other things on my YouTube channel as well, uh, including some music, because uh, I sing, and uh, things like that. So if you haven't subscribed, uh, please do so. And then you also won't miss the upcoming World Shapers uh, episodes. Finally, I want to mention again that uh, Shadowpaw Press is my publishing company. You can find it at shadowpawpress.com, where you can find information about the crowdfunder now running to help support a uh, gr- very aggressive nine-book uh, publishing season coming up for spring and summer. And uh, you can find Shadowpaw Press on Twitter at Shadowpaw Press, on Instagram at Shadowpaw Press, and on Facebook at Shadowpaw Press. I think I forgot to mention that I'm also on Instagram at Edward Willett Author. All right. Well, that's enough of that. Thanks for watching another episode of The World Shapers, or listening to it, if that's what you're doing. And I will be back uh, next week with another author. So until then, bye for now. Mm -hmm.